Hi everybody, this is Tim Krause again. Hey, I wanted to uh, I wanted to let you know I was right in the middle of doing a video series about cultish behavior and what is a cult, and somebody sent me a video that I could not help but respond to. I promise I'm going to get to back to the series, and we're going to talk about that in in the next couple of days. But I wanted to make sure that I had this presented first. This is very compelling. So let's go ahead and talk about this. The name of this video is going to be Interesting Things Message Ministers Say. This has to do with a, a sermon that was preached by Tim Pruitt on March the 22nd, 2020. Appreciate that somebody sent me this video excerpt. Very, very helpful. Uh, and again, I hope this is as compelling to you as it certainly was to me as I was doing the research. I'm, I'm calling this progressive revelation, but Really, what this is all about is, is there a red letter edition of the message? So I wanted to just basically take it from there. Now, we're uh, as normal, descriptions, study notes, links to the excerpts, all down in the bottom of the description there so that you can take a look at it. We're going to take this from a, a uh, more or less a, a message perspective today. We're going to take a look at this. We're going to have some... Scripture, but uh, not nearly as much scripture as we normally have because this is rather self-contained inside of a message, inside of the message of William Branham. So let's go ahead and get started with that, and then we'll show the video clip that uh, Tim Pruitt uh, of Tim Pruitt's sermon, and then we'll address that. But we're told by many, many message ministers, many, many message believers that William Branham's ministry aligned with scripture in every way. We're similarly told that William Branham taught only what the Apostle Paul taught, although we've done videos about that in the past, and you can take a look at those on my channel or at Believe the Sign YouTube channel as well, and that everything which William Branham said as a prophecy has come to pass or will come to pass. We're also told by William Branham himself that nothing he ever taught had to be modified or changed because it was always correct. Now, I'm going to give you an example of when he said that. Here is from the an exposition of the seven church ages, chapter 9, the Laodicean church age uh, chapter. This is this, I'm quoting him here. I want to read this, and I want to make sure that we emphasize this a little bit. But I deny upon the, now again, this is William Branham writing, but I deny upon the infallible evidence of the word that there is more than one major prophet messenger who will reserve the mysteries as contained in the word and who has the ministry to turn the hearts of the children to the father. Thus saith the Lord by his unfailing word stands and shall stand and be vindicated. There is one prophet messenger to this age. On the base of human behavior alone, anyone knows that there are many people, there is, where there are many people, there is even divided opinion in lesser points of a major doctrine which they all hold together. Who then will have the power of infallibility which is to be restored in this last age? For this last age is going to go back to manifesting the pure word bride. That means we will have the word once again as it was perfectly given and perfectly understood in the days of Paul. I will tell you who will have it. It will be a prophet as thoroughly vindicated, or even more thoroughly vindicated, than was any prophet in all the ages from Enoch to this day, because this man will of necessity have the capstone prophetic ministry, and God will show him forth. He needn't he won't need to speak for himself. God will speak for him by the voice of the sign. Amen. Now, as we know, William Branham proclaimed himself a prophet of God over 400 times in over 1,100 sermons. He proclaimed himself the last church age messenger, the, the seventh age church age messenger. Uh, he did that for himself as well. What would happen, though, if William Branham spoke about something as the truth, his teaching, because we just saw here now where he's infallible, according to William Branham which according to him is infallible, and then he was corrected and taught exactly the opposite. Now let's take an example. In his sermon, William Branham speaks about the white horse rider. 
William Branham tells us his interpretation about who the white horse rider is in the book of Revelations. I'm going to go through this. This is out of a, and it's long, so I'm not going to, I'm going to do as best I can to condense it. Please take a look at the entire uh, excerpt or the entire verse out of the sermon so that you realize that it's not out of context. This was in 1960. This was a December the 4th evening service, the Patmos Vision. This is what William Branham taught. What went out of his mouth? What went? The white horse rider. And Revelation also 7 when I believe 8. When the white horse, no it's 6. When the white horse rider went forth. He was given a bow to conquer and to conquer. And a sword went out of his mouth. What was he? The white horse rider, rider, rider of Revelation. Notice the sword. Out of his mouth goes a sharp two-edged sword, the word. And finally, by his word, when it's made manifest to all the sons of God, he'll tramp down every nation, down with his word by this sharp sword. Look here, what's happened as we get it. And his right hand and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. A sharp two-edged sword. What was going from the mouth of this person? The word of God. It's a sharp two-edged sword. What was it doing? Discerning the thoughts of the heart, the intents, goes even deeper than the meat, the flesh, the blood cells, into the bone, down into the marrow of the bone, plumb on beyond that, even to discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's what the word of God does. Now, go down a little bit more here, where he says, that's the gospel, the gospel on display. And here's another example of the same topic, different sermon. This was taught in 1963. Okay, so the first thing that we understand is that if we take a look at that, he tells us the white horse rider was Jesus Christ, the discerner of truth all the way down. It's the gospel itself. Another portion of that particular excerpt, the gospel is not the word only, Paul said Paul, so. Paul said the gospel didn't come to us through word only, but that word made manifest. When the word by the Holy Ghost is, the word is planted into the heart, that's got the Holy Ghost and produces what the word says it would. And the word can discern the thoughts of the heart. Glory, oh my, oh, a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart, the word does. Goes from his mouth, a sharp two-edged sword, Wake up the heathen. Something's got to happen one of these days. The word of God, his name was the word of God. The word made manifest. Look, Jesus said, go into all the world, Mark 16. His last salute to the church before he reveals, returns to reveal himself in the church age. He commissioned the church, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. What? Preach the gospel. Preach the gospel to every creature. So essentially, he's telling us that the white horse rider is Jesus Christ. It is Christ. Now here's another example that he teaches. Same topic, different sermon. Note the dates of the sermon. The first one, he taught the first one in 1960. This one he taught in 1963 in March. You may remember that that period of time was when he started to unveil the seals, according to William Branham. So let's take a look at this. It thundered when he spoke it out. This is, a, this is the first seal, March the 18th, 1963. Branham again speaking, it thundered when he spoke it out, and when he did, a white horse rider started out, and it still was a symbol. And now watch, he said, it would be known in the last day, but it comes forth in a church symbol. Do you understand it, church? Congregation says, amen. It comes forth in a symbol of a church that they know there is a seal, but just what is it, yet they don't know because it's a white horse rider. Down a little bit further, the voice is a thunder. The voice came from where? From the throne where the Lamb has just left, as intercessor. Okay? So we go a little bit further. He goes on to talk about, now someday he rises from the Father's throne and goes to take his own throne. Same sermon, a little bit further on. A white horse rider went out. See, who is he? He is the mighty in his conquering power. He's the great fellow in his conquering power. You want to tell me who he is? He is the Antichrist. Exactly what he is. Same topic. Different idea. 
1960, he talks about the White Horse Rider being Christ himself. Now in 1963, the first seal, he reveals that his interpretation, what his revelation from God is that the White Horse Rider is the Antichrist. I'm going to give you the same sermon, paragraph 35 through 39. Now, I would have had a horrible mistake on that. This is, again, Branham speaking. I would not would have had a horrible mistake on that if I hadn't if it hadn't been about 12 o'clock today when the Holy Spirit came in the room and corrected me on something that I was writing down to say. I was taking it from an old context. I had nothing on it. I don't know what the second seal is, no more than nothing. But I'd got some old context and something that I'd spoke on several years ago and wrote it down, and I gathered this context. Context And Dr. Smith, many great outstanding teachers that I'd gathered, and you may remember, He's talking about other prophets that he's, other people that he's, dispensationalists essentially that he's been, that he's been studying. And all of them believed that, so I wrote it down and I was fixing to say, well, now I'll study it from that standpoint. And there about 12 o'clock in the day, the Holy Spirit just swept right down into the room and the whole thing just opened up to me. And there it was of this, of this first seal being opened. We see here that William Branham says, I had this idea, this interpretation that I taught previously. I had planned on teaching that now. What I've discovered is Holy Spirit corrected me, 1963, and now he tells me the truth. The white horse rider is in fact the Antichrist, not Christ as he had originally said. So it's clear that William Branham changed direction while preaching the sermon called the First Seal in 1963. Well, Interesting question arises. William Branham said that he was born a prophet. We can go back and take a look at his sermons. William Branham declares that he was born a prophet, that he was a prophet of the Old Testament type. He says that he was never wrong. In fact, we just saw where he said he was infallible all the way through his ministry. What if you were in William's Branham meeting in 1960, but you were not in the meeting in 1963? What would be your impression based on what the person you were told was a prophet of God told you. See, you'd have wrong information, wouldn't you? The prophet told you personally because you were in that meeting that the white horse rider was Christ. Now, if you're lucky enough to be in the second meeting in 1963, then Branham would have given you a correct interpretation of the scripture. Would you be somewhat confused if you'd heard the first but not the second? Yeah, you'd be wrong, wouldn't you? Let's take a look at, you can look at scripture to see if a prophet of God ever gave a, an, a, a, a word from God. And when he gives you the word from God, he moves to a different town. God corrects him in the meanwhile, and he gives an entirely different word. Never happened in scripture. Didn't occur at all. Period. Now, William Branham proclaimed himself a prophet of God over 400 times in his 1,100 sermons. But we see no biblical support or no biblical basis for the fact that a prophet there in, in any of the Old Testament corrected himself and moved forward with a different interpretation. None. Period. Zip. Nada. So we're going to take a look at a current message minister. Here is Tim Pruitt. We're going to hear Tim Pruitt tell us about not discussing quotes from that 1960 sermon. So let's go ahead and take a listen to what Tim Pruitt said. Here's that video. Let's go ahead and roll that, and then we'll come back and talk about that. Here we go. And we need to understand that before the seals, even brother to Brother Branham. Now, I, I want you to listen carefully. Even to Brother Branham, the book was closed. It had to be open to him. You see, before that, he was one who probed at it. He crossed up a lot of scriptures. He had a church view of the book of Revelation and even some other scriptures. And this is what made the Bible become a new book to him when the seals were open. And some of these quotes are no different from the ones that refers to the white horse rider of the first seal being Christ. We'd never preach that. We'd never send those quotes around, would we? That, that, that's, that would be Christ, the, the white horse rider of the book of Revelation. We wouldn't send that around. We wouldn't. We read that, we understand. The seals corrected that. Right? 
And so we know that when the revelation was given, it wasn't Christ at all. It was the Antichrist. As Brother Branham said in the first seal, he said, oh, I would have absolutely today, and I hope that people are spiritual. I, I would have had made a horrible mistake on that if it hadn't been for about 12 o'clock today when the Holy Spirit came in the room and corrected me on something that I was writing down to say. You see, the seals were um, a definite turning point. A corner that was turned in Brother Branham's understanding. And so must it be for us. Okay. What is this confusion, this correction that Branham got highlight for us? Now, in his own words, William Branham flatly contradicts the facts that he was infallible. He first told us, White Horse Rider, Antichrist, or Christ himself... Then he comes back and he gets corrected and he tells us white horse rider, Antichrist. Okay? So Tim Pruitt helps us to understand that there are sermons which aren't taught by the current message ministry because the wrong information was presented in those sermons. And it might confuse people, so we don't send those around. We don't talk about those. We don't send any of that around, remember, according to Tim Pruitt. Now, <clears throat> but this this wasn't the only place. This wasn't the only position where William Branham got corrected. Let's take a look at a couple of others here. And the first one is, this is a big doctrine for the message. This is the Trinity. I had a discussion one time with a message minister, and I'll tell you his conclusion after I go through some of this with you. But let's take an example of William Branham's teaching on the Trinity. Remember, this is a major doctrine for the message. In 1951, note the date, William Branham says this, and now there are those sitting here who are feeble this afternoon that's in need of physical healing, and we have chosen these few words to read from thine, and may the Holy Spirit, the third person in the Trinity, come in now, the promise, the comforter, that you said you would send. Branham, the resurrection of Lazarus, July 29th, morning service, 1951. Here's 1953, April the 3rd, the cruelty of sin. Again, note the date. God is perfect in three. He's perfect. Brother Branham clears his throat. Pardon me. He's perfect in Father, Son, Holy Spirit. He's perfect in justification, sanctification, baptism of the Holy Spirit. He's perfected in his threes. Here is demonology, religious realm. 1953, this is June the 9th a.m. service. Note the date again, 1953. God's in a trinity. God's powers is in a trinity. And the devil's in a trinity, and his powers is in trinity. I can prove it by the Bible, and that's Urim Thummim was only the crystal ball that the devil uses today. And the false prophet back here today, the one that we have now, was the witch or the fortune teller out yonder took place of the prophet of the devil's side. See what I mean? Now, so he's got basically three here that we can see where he talks specifically about God being in the Trinity. He's teaching the Trinity. Now, let's take a look. Somewhere along the line, William Branham appears to have been corrected. Corrected. 1959, again, note the date. Palmer worm, locust, canker worm, caterpillar. Now, this is before the seals. And that's important, and we'll see why that's important a little bit later. This is before he teaches the seals in March of 1963. But here's what William Branham says. You say the Blessed Holy Trinity. Find me the word Trinity anywhere in the pages of God's Bible. It's a man-made scheme, an old dirty church rag wrapped around to take the place of the sap line of God's Holy Spirit. There's no such a thing. There's no such a thing. You find it and come to me. You're duty-bound to do it as a Christian if you find it. It's not a God's holy writings, and the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost is hatched out of hell. Now, then we've got 1960. This is a September 25th sermon, the, that day on Calvary. Branham again speaks. Where do you get that triune pagan doctrine? Out of a catechism, not out of the Bible. The word Trinity is not even mentioned in the whole scriptures from Genesis to Revelation. There's no such thing. There's no such thing as a Trinitarian God. So here Branham mixes up two concepts. This is a prophet of God, remember. He's got a special revelation of God. Branham talks about a triune God 
And then he talks about a Trinitarian God. They are two different concepts, but he conflates them in this one message or in this one sermon where he talks about the Trinity being pagan. About the Trinity, there's no such thing. This is, a, this is out of a catechism. Here he is in 1961, again, prior to the seals, January the 8th, Revelation chapter 4. Now, my precious brothers, I know this tape also. Now, don't get excited. Let me say this with godly love. The hour is approached where I can't hold still on these things no more. Too close to the coming, see. Trinitarianism is of the devil. I say that thus saith the Lord. Now, he's speaking with God's authority, his self-proclamation of God's authority, thus saith the Lord. He said, thus saith the Lord, 1,616 times. Here we have 1961. He is proclaiming using, thus saith the Lord. Look where it come from. It come from the Nicene Council when the Catholic Church became in rulership. The word Trinity is not even mentioned in the entire book of the Bible. Turns out that that's not true. Turns out that there's lots of people because of the end of the book of Matthew where Jesus says, go out and baptize people in the name of the Father, the name of the Son, and the name of the Holy Ghost, that he, people talked about the Trinity well into the first century. The Nicene Council actually wasn't held until uh, about 300 A.D., a little bit after 300 A.D., but let's ignore the fact that it was from the Nicene Council because there's a lot of writing and a lot of scholarly writings that talks about the Trinity before that, after the book of Acts. But ignoring that, let's just let's just focus on this. He talks about this uh, where thus saith the Lord, he has God's authority, his self-proclamation of God's authority that says Trinitarianism of, is of the devil. Now, did God change his mind again? Did God change his mind back? Let's take a look. Here's William Branham. Goes back to his original teaching. Now, this is in 1965. This is April the 18th, the morning service. It is the rising of the sun. Here, William Branham again teaches about the Trinity. But now, the true Trinity of God being one manifested in Christ, who was life and had broke the seals and conquered the enemy and rose up in one true and living God. I am he that was dead, and I am alive forevermore and have the key to death and hell. God in one made man and dwelt among us and conquered every enemy. Now he's talking about that triune God that he said had no place in Scripture before, right? And had proved that the Trinity of Satan was conquered and that the Trinity of God was made known. Again, conflating the Trinity with the triune God. Because only God alone had power to bring life back again. He was that Emmanuel. God has been manifested in the flesh. Again, this is 1965. This is April the 18th, the morning service. So which one of those is correct? I actually had a discussion with a message minister about this. Message minister told me, well, the middle ones were correct. And I said, how do you know? Here, William Branham taught that that, you know, he was, that was a trinity prior to him teaching that there was no such thing as a trinity. Then he goes back and touches again about the trinity, conflating the triune and the trinity, but talking about the trinity and promoting the trinity again. Which one of those is correct? Well, the only one that he said under, that's thus saith the Lord, you see, was the one that says that the trinity was of the devil. So that's the only one we accept. William Branham told us, and I showed it to you earlier, that he was infallible. That he had thus saith the Lord all the way through his ministry. Interesting. Here's just one more example. This example has to do with whether someone in a church other than a message church should stay in their congregation or leave their congregation and attend a message assembly. Now, notice the dates of the sermon and how the changes flopped backwards and forwards again. We'll talk about the, the dates in a moment. Here, William Branham says, stay. Don't go anywhere. This is 1955, November the 11th, where I think Pentecost failed. William Branham speaking. I have deep respect for every organization. I think we're all good, every one of them. I will not talk against them because I have many fine brethren in every one of them. And never on the platform under the visions have I ever seen the Holy Spirit challenge anybody and tell them they was in the wrong church. I've never done that. 
Here's another example. Remember 1958. This is a March 16th morning service as the eagle stirreth her nest and fluttereth over her young. Little eaglet that been dissatisfied. Now I'm not telling you to leave your denomination. If you're Baptist, remain a Baptist. If you're a Presbyterian, remain that. But what I'm trying to tell you to do is to step out on Jehovah's wings once. Your eagle, your church don't believe in divine healing. You don't believe in the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You don't believe in this being born again. Step out one time and find out the promise Jesus said. Except a man be born again, he can't even understand the kingdom of God. That's 1958. Stay where you're at. Be a Baptist. Be a Presbyterian if that's what you are. Here's another example. Now this is 1963. Interestingly enough, this is what William Branham taught after he opened the seals. This is August the 3rd. This is investment. Now you're here this morning for some reason, see? Why? Why are you here anyhow? There's this little tinkle in there that tells you. Now I'm not saying to leave your church. You go to your church a better person than you was when you left it. You'll be a light that's set upon a hill. A candle that's lit and not covered with a basket. You have eternal life. This is after he perched the seals. He's telling people to stay where they are. 1965, this is what he says. Now, I'm not saying leave your church. No, sir. This was 1965, January the 20th, lean not unto thine own understanding. Now, I'm not saying leave your church. No, sir. Stay right there where you're at. Just be a real Holy Ghost field person in that church. You say, well, I don't know what my pastor will say. He'll appreciate you if you are, if he's a man of God. That's right. That's what William Branham said. Now, here's what he's, what, he tells us to go. He tells us to get out of our church or our denomination. This is 1963. This was a month prior to him teaching the sermon two, two excerpts ago. Just a month prior to him telling people to stay, this is what William Branham said. You Presbyterians, you Methodists and Baptists and Lutherans, and this full gospel businessmen stuff, saying they're coming in, turned away the message. Your church will. There'll be individuals in there, sure, but not the church. You have to come out of the church to get it, see? That's right. Individuals is all right. Go. Get out of your... You have to come out of the church to get it. Here he is in 1965. And this was at the end of the year. The last one where he said stay. Now I'm just staying, saying leave your church was in January 65. Here's one in November 28th morning service. God's only provided place of worship 1965. Now either, even Luther who had the truth and taught the church the just shall live by faith. You don't want to hang on to that being the full doctrine in the Methodist stage. What shall you do? Burn it with fire. What was the type of? The denomination that comes out of that word is a shuck. The stock, the husks, must be burnt with fire. That denominational part that it come through must not remain. Going, got to die. Don't leave it till the breaking of another, another age. Burn it up. He's talking now to the bride there, just the bride, coming up through every age. And he's already told us that he's a seventh church aid messenger, that that's not going to work for these other, these other dispensations. So he's telling you to leave. Here's another one. Again, 1965. This one is the day before the one that I just spoke. This is November the 27th, 1965. There were that great man, that great Pentecostal man, Jehoshaphat got mixed up in the wrong crowd, and that's what happened to your Pentecostals today. There's some real men in there, but they're mixed up in that denominational crowd. Get out of that thing. It's cursed of the Lord. Now, should you stay or should you go? William Branham, from his first quote in the 50s to the last quote that I just read in 1965, stay, go, stay, go, stay, go, stay, go. Quite a mix of of what he says in his sermons there. A little bit of confusion there. My guess is, William Branham said to stay until people started to question him and go after him in terms of his doctrine, and then he had to tell people to go because they could not stay in those assemblies and believe his message. And after all, according to William Branham, 
he was a seventh church age messenger. So he was the only one that could reveal the truth. So we've seen instances of many, many, many instances where William Branham contradicted himself and then contradicted himself and then contradicted himself during his ministry. We shared the video of Tim Pruitt confirming that current message ministers avoid speaking about things which they know are incorrect in the sermons of William Branham, who claimed to be a prophet of God over 400 times in over 1,100 sermons and proclaimed that he was infallible and nothing he ever taught ever had to be changed. So what is it? So what's to be done? What do we do? You see, there's a denomination of the message known as the Progressive Revelation Denomination. Now, these ministers teach that William Branham didn't have the full revelation until he taught the seven seals in 1963. This denomination of the message teaches that the sermons of William Branham prior to the teaching of the seals are pretty much irrelevant, that they're not fully inspired by God. Just as Tim Pruitt said in the video, God had to reveal the seals to him. So he poked at it, he probed it, but he just didn't have the full revelation. Okay? The, only the sermons which they speak about in this particular denomination, and there are many churches that follow this, only the sermons that they speak about are after or, or opening after March, beginning of March 1963 and the opening of the seals. There are some fundamental problems with that belief. Now, we showed you that William Branham claimed that he was infallible. If he was infallible, none of that would have happened. No, none of that confusion would have taken place. See, Branham didn't discriminate in proclaiming that he was infallible as to a specific time frame. That is when it should start, when it should end. His proclamation of infallibility is absolute and takes in his entire ministry. Because according to that statement, he's a vindicated prophet of God, the vindicated prophet of God, in the hour that will tell you the truth. But we've seen how that didn't work for him. So that's an issue with the progressive revelation crowd. It's an issue with what Tim Pruitt said. Also, William Branham proclaimed that he was speaking on God's authority, thus saith the Lord, 1,616 times during his ministry. 1,616 times during his ministry. So if we were to believe that we should ignore William Branham's sermons prior to 1963 and the opening of the seals, then according to Scripture... William Branham spoke, thus saith the Lord. He spoke proclaiming God's authority, his self-proclamation of God's authority about 1,350 times between the start of his ministry and 1963 when he received his full revelation from God. You see, the Bible calls that speaking presumptuously. Let's take a look at what Scripture says about that. Deuteronomy chapter 18 Verses 20 through 22. But the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name which I have not commanded him to speak. Let me go back and read it again. But the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name. That's thus saith the Lord. Proclamate his self-proclaimed prophecy or proclamation of God's scriptural authority. His vindication as a prophet of God. Which I have not commanded him to speak or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. And if thou say in thine heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord hath not spoken? When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken. But the prophet has spoken it presumptuously. Thou shalt not be afraid of him. In other words, he that prophet presumed to speak in the name of the Lord. William Ran himself proclaimed prophet scriptural authority of thus saith the Lord. At least 1,350 times, if we listen to the progressive revelation guys, 1,350 times roughly, he spoke thus saith the Lord presumptuously. He didn't have the full revelation of God, yet he spoke, thus saith the Lord, 
over that period of time. And even Tim Pruitt tells us he didn't have the whole revelation. He was just probing it. He was just playing around the edges. But and so of course we never ever talk about that. We know we don't we don't have to talk about those quotes. Third, as we saw in the examples earlier, William Branham presented sermons prior to March of 1963, after which he had a full revelation, but changed his doctrinal positions even after his full revelations. When he said, stay, go, leave, you know, be there, whatever he said, we can see that he jumped around and did, and, and was, you know, he did that a lot. And we can see where that, where that took place. Now we can also see as an example in the Trinity where he went back to teaching the Trinity even after he had a full revelation. So we know that he flip-flopped a lot. He went back and forth a lot on some of his doctrines. Now what do we conclude in all of this? Although William Branham claims that he was infallible, he was demonstrably nothing of the sort. Even modern day ministry ministers agree to that. Tim Pruitt in the video that we saw just demonstrated that. And we've shown you in sermons in three good examples where William Branham taught things and then reversed himself and then in one case reversed himself back. In one case he was all over the place for his entire ministry about whether to go or stay. Message ministers denominate the message in an attempt to cover up for William Branham's changing positions during his ministry. So the progressive revelation ministries who say don't pay it is all the sermons prior to March 1963 when he opened the seals are largely irrelevant have created a denomination based on their interpretation of scripture. Okay. Thus say of the Lord is not reliable when roughly 1,350 proclamations are deemed to be irrelevant prior to the seals by many message ministers and message believers, mostly the progressive revelation denomination. But we saw Tim Pruitt say the same thing. Ewald Frank, who is a disciple of William Branham, believed and taught that unless William Branham said something was thus saith the Lord, Branham was just speaking for himself. And he was not speaking for God, as Branham and current message ministers have told us that he does. A lot of current message ministers base the doctrine that they find by choosing which sermons they're going to preach, which ones support their particular interpretation of Branham's message. But certainly, not all of what they teach is thus saith the Lord. So now we have somebody who's an extreme. Not only is it a progressive revelation, it's an extreme component of that that says only when he says thus saith the Lord is it true is that a revelation from God is that God's proclamation to him Ewald believed that you should only consider when Branham said thus saith the Lord is a prophetic utterance but as we've shown you in other videos thus saith the Lord is not reliable and failed many 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 times many times South Africa vision brown bear vision Many, many, many other instances where thus saith the Lord was proven to be incredible, totally unreliable, was not a proclamation of God at all. Now, message ministers today are certainly aware that there are errors in the teaching of William Branham throughout his ministry, but they gloss over these errors simply by not teaching the sermons, which they believe are in error. This means that current message believers are dependent upon their ministers' interpretations of the message of William Branham. We're going to give you some examples of that, but I want to say, even within denominations of the message, those message ministers have different views. If you talk about the, day, the Seven Thunders as an example, we'll talk about them in a minute, but there's open warfare in the Seven Thunders denominations of the message. I mean, they're a mess. They're, they're a hot mess happening right now. So let's talk about a couple. <clears throat> we have the progression, re progressive revelations. Uh, and, and by the way, the issue of interpretation by ministers leads to the denomination of the message into sects or groups. We have the progressive revelation. We've discussed that previously. 
We've got the return ministry group. They believe that William Branham's failed prophecies now, at least they admit that he, he had failed prophecies, but that his failed prophecies will come to pass when William Branham is raised from the dead prior to the return of Christ. Remember the airplane that was on the tarmac loaded up with all of the materials that he needed for his South Africa campaign because he was going to raise from the dead. Note the people that stand by William Branham's grave and wait for him every Easter to rise from the dead so that he can foretell the coming of Jesus Christ. There's a whole group of people that, that believe that. At least, though, they, they understand and will admit that his, some of his prophecies did not come to pass. So that's encouraging. There's the Price, Christ Branham group. This is the Lee Vales and the Fred Sothmans, and there are others who believe that William Branham was Christ incarnate on the earth. This group even denies the deity of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> that's a shame, and that's an entire group of people. Then there are the, the Perugia group. They believe that we're currently living in the millennium, similar to the Jehovah's Witnesses today. Then we've got the Seven Thunders. Their current ministers are the capstone ministry who believe that Branham was okay, but he didn't go far enough. That they alone are the eighth prophet messenger. And they were, they're, they're at open warfare with each other who also believe they're the eighth messenger or the eighth capstone minister, the eighth prophet. That, that group is a hot mess. So now not only do you have to believe in Branham as a prophet of God, you've got to believe in your minister as a prophet of God. You know, and, and boy, you know, try to follow that and then go all the way back to Scripture. It's a hot mess. It's a hot mess. There's a group of people who justify polygamy as a way of life using marriage and divorce and other sermons to justify polygamy. I had a conversation one time with a a minister who was in Africa, and he wrote me and said, the fact that William Branham had two uh, marriage licenses proved that he was polygamous. I had to write him and send him copies of the death certificate of his first wife in order to say, William Branham did not have two wives at the same time. <laughs> he had two wives. He was a widower and remarried. That guy was shocked by the death certificates, and I never heard anything from him again. My guess is he either chose to ignore it, or he was finally forced to face the truth, I would hope. At any rate, these people believe that William Branham taught polygamy because of some of the things he said in marriage and divorce. And this is That's a, a whole separate topic for an entirely different time. There are other denominations inside of the message. These are just a few that are the more prominent ones whose doctrines or whose positions are easily encapsulated uh, into, you know, into what they believe or have articulated what they believe uh, in a cogent form. So, but we know that there are others as well. What we know and what Tim Pruitt has confirmed for us is that William Branham taught many, many things and then went backwards and forwards he slid around all over the place. He had positions that were completely contradictory, not only to themselves, but of the Bible. Certainly not all of these things were taught under thus saith the Lord. We know that thus saith the Lord, if you looked at other videos, is incredibly unreliable. So the question is, how does one put faith in someone who claims to be a prophet of God when their proclamation, their self-proclamation of God's authority, that's thus saith the Lord, fails. When what they teach gets reversed and then corrected again and then back and forth and back and forth. When they have current ministers who say, well, we just don't teach those sermons because, of course, we know that that's wrong. We know that that's not a doctrine that we should approach or that's not a doctrine that we should teach. Is there a red letter edition of the message? Red letter edition of the Bible shows where Jesus spoke and Jesus did not contradict himself. Jesus did not ever have to be, you know, have to be corrected or fixed. The apostle Paul, always in line with what Jesus spoke. We've shown that over and over and over again. Challenge is, how does one put their faith in the prophet 
when we're told that some of the stuff that he spoke we're not going to teach because it wasn't correct. But what we are going to teach, that's the correct stuff. If you go to a different church, it's a different set of sermons because they have a different idea about what William Branham spoke as correct. And that's a shame. So listen, I, I needed to throw that in there. I appreciate the person that sent me this video. This was important to address. I wanted to kind of do that before we moved on with the series about what is a cult. Trying to space them apart a little bit so that people get an idea, uh, an opportunity to di digest it, get an opportunity to take a look at it. Like always, notes, video, everything else is going to be available for you. Links down in the description. Uh, you will have seen the notes up here. You can follow along with me. Uh, I hope everybody had a great Thanksgiving in the U.S. Hope everybody's doing really, really well, no matter where you are throughout the world. I hope these, you're getting something out of these videos. Uh, and, I, and I really am appreciative of the people that send the video clips and send the excerpts of the videos. It really prompts me to do a lot of research and a lot of study and to look at those things. More than ever, I'm thankful for Tim Pruitt for appointing that out for the person to send me the video clip that William Branham was unreliable in terms of what he taught. We knew that, but now we have confirmation of it from Tim Pruitt and because of what we have just gone through in the study. So I appreciate everybody. Listen, have a fabulous Christmas season. Celebrate the birth of Christ. Be glad that... that Christ is born, it's coming really, really soon. And then we have another year coming up, 2022. Hope everybody is doing okay with this COVID resurgence that we find with this new variant of COVID. I think there's going to be a variant of COVID regularly. But hope everybody's doing okay. We're just praying for everybody and hoping that everybody survives through this. Hope that churches are being safe and, and uh, hope the members of the congregation are being responsible we just really love everybody, and we really look forward to talking to you again. In the meanwhile, God bless you. Have a great holiday, and a, we're looking forward to 2022. So thank you very much for your time. We appreciate it. Bye-bye now. Mm -hmm.